Uh, it is four o'clock Eastern time right now. I want to welcome everybody to the NGSS Earth and Space Science webinar series, which has been progressing for about two and a half years, sponsored by the American Geosciences Institute's Center for Geoscience and Society, the National Association of Geoscience Teachers, and the National Earth Science Teachers Association. Today's webinar is one of a series. This one is being put on by Michael Ranney from University of California, Berkeley. It is titled, Quickly Increasing Anthropogenic Warming Acceptance, Five Experimentally Vetted Methods and HowGlobalWarmingWorks.org. We'll be, um, I'll give a couple of announcements here at the beginning and then we'll go into Michael's presentation. You should feel free to enter questions in the chat box if you'd like, and I will uh, monitor that, and then we'll have about 45 minutes of Michael's presentation, and then we will um, stop for questions, and I'll have just a couple of announcements at the end as well. And um, Michael, I believe you're in control of the slide. So let me, on this slide, let me just remind everybody, we are being recorded, um, but please um, do mute yourself and also uh, turn off your video just so it doesn't conflict with the presenter. There are potential um, interactions if you'd like to raise your hand and such. We do have enough uh, people in the webinar that we may not notice those. So I would recommend that you enter any questions in the chat box. I should say before we leave this slide that I am Ed Robeck. I direct education and outreach and policy at the American Geosciences Institute and I'll be moderating today. Um, could you advance the slide, Michael? Um, I'm trying to, let's see. Oh, did that work? That did. Great. <clears throat> Again, the webinar is being recorded and you will see that the uh, recordings of other webinars are available to you. I'll mention that in just a moment. Uh, again, you can see the title. The organizers of this series are listed there. Aida Awad is a past president of NAGT and has been on the executive committee in other roles, secretary and treasurer. Um, I'm the one speaking, as I indicated. Carla McAuliffe is also with us as a participant today, um, helping to moderate. She's the National Earth Science Teachers Association Executive Director. Jessica Bean is at UCMP, the University of California Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley. And Andrew Havilis is our helping with the technical part of this today. He's with the Science Education Resource Center and NAGT. And we can advance the slide, Michael. So again, um, we really want to welcome Michael Ranney, who is at University of California, Berkeley. He's in the Graduate School of Education and in the Cognitive Science faculty. He's also a faculty member in the Department of Psychology and a member of the Institute for Personality and Social Research at University of California. Um, there will be opportunities for question and answer, and there will also be, at the end, I'll ask you to go uh, each participant to go to the link that you see there and um, provide us with some input about this particular webinar. Go ahead, Michael. <clears throat> Before we begin today, I just want to mention that there are a couple of future events that are coming up in this series. For those of you who are going to be going to the American Geophysical Union conference in Washington, D.C. in December. There will be a geophysical information for teachers workshop. Those are called gift workshops on December 11th, put on by this team. It is using 360 imagery to support place-based instruction. We'll be focusing specifically on watersheds as the content area there. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and then in January, we will have another webinar. We will skip December, which has been our pattern, but we will have another webinar in December. Um, also, as you can see there, there is a, um, a link to the past webinars. There are now, I believe, 23 past webinars 
that all have to do with next generation science standard implementation, especially in the earth and space sciences. Okay, Michael. And then please do feel free to type questions into the chat box. Andrew and I will be monitoring those as we go. And with no further ado, I'd like to um, thank Michael Ranney for this presentation and that you can see the title there. And Michael, I'll let you begin. Great, thanks so much, Ed. This is my first webinar formally, so um, <clears throat> it's an experiment for me. But thanks for, um, for coming and viewing this. Uh, and uh, you can see the title up at the top. Uh, basically, as Ed mentioned, uh, what I and my group specialize in is trying to get people to accept global warming uh, and hopefully to think it's a, a difficulty, something we should address, and that that uh, climate change is uh, caused by humans. And what I'll be talking about is five different ways that we've uh, found that actually increases people's acceptance of global warming. And uh, we can say that because we run randomized controlled experiments with these. And, uh, and so another way to think about it is that it reduces denial of global warming. So that's me and my institution. And of course, there's a cast of many. These are just some of the many people who've helped. And here are a couple of uh, references if you're interested. Uh, and I'll have these later on as well uh, on the ending slide. So let's go ahead and dive in. And I can give you a little bit of sense of what my research group uh, works on, the reasoning group. Uh, basically, if you think about what we're doing, uh, there's sort of science cognition, uh, and then there's uh, mathematical cognition, especially things related to numeracy, and also things that are of societal importance. And uh, in the center of that, the triple intersection sweet spot is the climate change cognition, is what I've been specializing in lately. So I want to give you sort of a phenomenal sense of uh, where exactly we are with respect to this. And uh, so I want you to try and uh, choose for yourself among two different slides, two different graphs. So these are graphs and I'll, t I'll ask you first of all, whether you think these are going up or going down or flat. Well, most, mostly this time people say, duh, of course they're going up. And I can tell you that one of these is a representation of the Earth's surface temperature over time. Whoops. Sorry, I didn't know how that worked. <laughs> Sorry about that. And the other one is uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average over time. So as you can see, uh, both, of, both of them are going up and it turns out that people can't really tell them apart and that's partly the point here. And uh, so each of these dots represent 16 years of data. And this is one of the five ways in which we increase people's acceptance of global warming. These are what we call Bex graphs because the cover story is that uh, there's an alien robot that lands on Earth, doesn't know if things are going up or going down, but here's on the radio that uh, temperature may be going up, stocks are going up, and the robot knows that if you just average, you can sort of figure things out. So uh, this is one of the, uh, the five ways that we've uh, shown with experiments. It actually increases people's acceptance. Each of these uh, five ways is like six minutes or less, so they're very short, they're like micro curricula. And it's important to point out that uh, the, you know, you know the, there's a, a worry that we might get to, to be six degrees hotter in the not that distant future. And uh, that might be a small amount for many people to wrap their head around, but it would be as if your body temperature went up to 109 degrees. So that wouldn't be good for a body, wouldn't be good for a planet that's well balanced like ours is either. And as I go along, I'll mention a few things that sort of relate to the, uh, the next generation of science standard. So you see on the bottom right, there are a couple of, uh, of uh, different sort of science standards. Uh, and I'll connect with these a little bit more as we go, although that's not my main uh, element of expertise. So usually I give you know, a, a longer talk than this, and so I'm not sure exactly what I'll get to today, but this is sort of an aspirational outline if, uh, if I could uh, have you for even longer. Uh, so I'll give some background on the US diverging from other nations on global warming, but hopefully that's changeable. Uh, basically what I do is a psychology in the public interest sort of approach to people who are denying climate change. And one of the keys of our experiments is that we don't have deceptions. Like uh, we're giving true information and you can share this information with your family now. That's what we, we tell our participants. And one of the problems is that there's a dearth of really good climate change knowledge. And it's not just true in the United States, but we've done studies in Germany and with Japanese people and such. And so of the five ways you'll see that I'll be talking about that increase people's acceptance of global warming, they'll be in blue. 
So the first one is the 400 word uh, description, which is just text, 400 words. You can read it in about two minutes. And we've done about seven different experiments or more where we actually see if, if this is useful and it turns out it does. And we've done it in California, Texas, Germany. And uh, the MTurk sample that I'll be referring to, the US MTurk, that's, uh, that's a corpus of people that are online participants who are willing to be in psychology experiments who are a little bit more nationally representative, but not perfectly natural, nationally representative. And what we find is that there are huge increases in knowledge if you just give people these 400 words about the mechanism of global warming, and that also increases their acceptance and concern about global warming as well. And the good news is that it works for both, both for conservatives and for liberals. So we found that in our MTurk studies, for instance, that uh, both, both the most liberal and the most conservative people increase their acceptance of global warming uh, based on the information we give them. So there's no polarization uh, where sometimes the fear is that people who are op opposed to believing that the earth is even getting hotter, that you give them information and they oppose it even more. That just doesn't happen in our studies. And also, clearly we're finding that people are changing. So they're not static, there's no stasis, and there's pretty good, good longevity. Like we test people often with delayed post-tests up to 34 days, and we still find that they're changed in the, in, the, uh, in the direction that you would expect given that information. I'm also gonna connect some of the work with uh, what I call numerically driven inferencing. And that's where we use statistics and graphs. So not just mechanistic sort of stuff. And uh, some of this we've run with 11th graders, uh, like a, a junior high, chemistry, uh, high school chemistry class. And some of them we give the mechanism and the, some diagnostic numbers. But this third way in blue is just giving people representative statistics. We ask them to make an estimate and then we give them the feedback value. We also use other statistics that I won't have time to talk about today, uh, but part of what we also do is we give information about sea level rise and some of that is statistical as well. Sometimes it's with maps and I'll have some examples of that. So that's our, our third way. Our fourth way is, as I mentioned, is uh, BEX graphs uh, with those uh, graphs of temperature over time and contrasting it with the stock market over time. And through the magic of averaging, you can tell which way the wind is blowing on a given issue. I'll talk about how globalwarmingworks.org, which is our direct to the public website. And we've been translating some of the materials into other languages. So beyond the videos we have, you can see the videos in Mandarin. And that's the fifth way we use videos to sort of explain the information as well. Uh, much of that is mechanistic, but we usually throw in some statistics as well. And we've done a mega study that by a time we'll talk about uh, with respect to how these different types of, uh, of these five ways, how they uh, relate to each other, like which ones might be give more bang per buck and whatnot. And as I mentioned, I'll point out occasionally these connections to the NGSS performance expectations. Most of them, as you see, come from fifth grade uh, for the ESS2 hyphen one, all the way to high school with the ESS3 hyphen six. So you can check those out later and I'll have a little slide uh, about those as well. So if you wanna roll the video back and have a look at something that was going by very fast, uh, you can see that later. And of course, we'll have some conclusions. So these are the standards I was talking about. And so here's one, and I've sort of underlined some of the particular aspects that our information helps with um, uh, more so than, than many. And so I'll, I'll just buzz through these and you, you can check these out later on the web if you like, uh, but you can give it a sense that we're addressing, you know, uh, a good handful of, of standards with respect to the information we provide. Although the information we provided was just general, the general public, we try to write the information so that it's like fifth grade language and so forth, so that, you know, it, it uh, affords a lot of people understanding the information. Well, as you probably know, there's some science defamation going on that sort of suggests that you can't trust uh, climate scientists and whatnot. So that sort of motivates my work to some degree. But I think it's worth pointing out, and you might consider pointing this out for students as well, that real scientists overwhelmingly wish that global warming weren't happening, that it weren't true. Uh, and especially people who have children or like children, or even people who care about their older selves who are worried about what they might eat. And it's not the case that PhDs can't do something else, there's a very low jobless rate and there's high job satisfaction. So these people who are looking at climate cognition or climate science, they could do other things if they wanted to. And so <clears throat> I think it's kind of a libel to sort of impugn scientists' goals about this, uh, suggesting uh, that they have some problem. And in fact, I personally, you know, would be just ecstatic if uh, global warming weren't happening. In fact, I make this pledge whenever I give talks 
that if someone could just please convince me that I'm deluded, I would go rent the largest SUV I could find, um, drive to wherever that person is, give them a kiss if they like that, stop doing my work entirely on climate change cognition, and give back any dollar I got in funding in terms of climate change cognition. And in fact, if anyone thought they could disconfirm global warming, they would do it in a heartbeat. I would, and you know, I'd expect to be the most famous scientist alive, and I'd probably win the Nobel Prize, and if someone could tell me the secret information that would help me disconfirm it, I'd, I'd split the money with them. So, you know, the problem is that there's a lot of misinformation and cherry-picked information out there. It's rather ubiquitous. And uh, sometimes it does come back with the suggestion that scientists are biased, and certainly not every scientist is pure as the driven snow, but they're pretty darn trustworthy as things go. So it turns out that the good news about climate change and changing people's minds about it is that people and societies do change, that we're not in a stasis. And uh, if you think about it, most companies in all countries would love to disconfirm global warming. You know, they're, you know who types of companies that would love even if they're publicly accepting global warming, they're actually ho hoping that it's, it would not be true. There are tons of nations, especially those with petroleum products and other fossil fuels who love it to be false. So the mere fact that we haven't been able to disconfirm global warming tells you a lot about the, the likelihood that it's true. And the other good news is that people and societies can learn that they aren't in a, in a point of stasis. This was true when uh, the power of the papacy was trying to convince folks like Galileo that they should give up heliocentrism. Uh, it's certainly true with tobacco money that was trying to convince people that they should give up the idea that there's a link between smoking and cancer. So our hope is that maybe knowledge can help with the climate as it did with planets and smoking. And I think it's a false dichotomy to suggest, as Dan Kahn sometimes does, that you can't change people's minds with information. You can only change cultures. That's pretty much poppycock as far as I'm concerned. And it's a false dichotomy in the same way that the nature-nurture dichotomy is, uh, falls down as well. And indeed, Khan sort of like uh, has a rear guard action on his own positions. If you look at what he's written about physicians or even his own data on how geoengineering can change people's minds about climate change. So the good news also is that we can fix climate change sort of easily, or at least readily. And it turns out that we spend about $5 trillion a year as a species who just subsidizing fossil fuels. And if you convert that for like uh, some decades or so, we could completely uh, change the planet to, uh, uh, to more sustainable fuels uh, just by using that subsidy. So it's, it's really a win-win, win-win-win if you think about um, moving away from fossil fuels. And we could be the, the next gener the greatest generation. Well, enough of the soapbox, uh, but I hopefully, hopefully some of that will be useful for people who are teachers in terms of getting these ideas across in classrooms as well. I wanna get back to the particular ways that we use to help people understand global warming. So I want you to think about this question, how is it that Earth is getting hotter? What's the physical or chemical mechanism? And uh, I want you to try to explain how climate change is occurring. Think about that for a little bit while I problematize it a little bit more. And one question is, how is it that heat has a hard time getting away from Earth's surface and its troposphere, you know, the atmosphere that's uh, close, to the, uh, close to the earth, uh, shouldn't heat have just as hard a time getting in? Why is this there asymmetry of heat coming in and getting out? Why is there that sort of asymmetry? So at this point, if it works, what I'd like to do is to show you one of the videos. This is the three minute video from our website and we have five videos that go from one minute to almost five minutes. I'm gonna show you one just to give you a little phenomenal sense of how we explain this to our participants. And if I can switch over, we'll see if, uh, if I can do that. Here we go. You may have heard of global climate change, which is often called global warming. But how much do regular people understand the science of climate change? Take a moment to try to explain to yourself how virtually all climate scientists think the Earth is warming. What is the physical or chemical mechanism? In one study, we asked almost 300 adults in the US and not a single person could accurately explain the mechanism of global warming at a pretty basic level. Allow us to give you a short explanation of how global warming works. First, here is how Earth's temperature works without considering how humans influence it. The Earth absorbs light from the sun, which is mostly visible light. 
to release that light energy, Earth also emits light. But because the Earth is cooler than the sun, it emits lower energy infrared light. So, Earth's surface essentially transforms most of the visible light it gets from the sun into infrared light. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such as methane and carbon dioxide, let visible light pass through but absorb infrared light, causing the atmosphere to retain heat. This energy can be absorbed and emitted by the atmosphere many times before it eventually returns to outer space. The added time this energy hangs around has helped keep Earth warm enough to support life as we know it. Without this greenhouse effect caused by these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the Earth's average surface temperature would be about 50 degrees Fahrenheit cooler, which is well below the freezing point for ice. So how have humans changed things? Since the dawn of the industrial age around the year 1750, atmospheric carbon dioxide has increased by 40% and methane has almost tripled. These increases cause extra infrared light absorption, meaning an extra greenhouse effect, which has caused Earth to heat above its typical temperature range. In other words, energy that gets to Earth has an even harder time leaving it, causing Earth's average temperature to increase, thus producing global climate change. Please share this video with others so you can help them understand how global warming works too. So that was the video. Hopefully that came across okay. I'm going to uh, switch back to my uh, slides if that works. Looks good from my end. Hopefully you can see it okay. Um, so hopefully after seeing that video, uh, and that's like one of the five, the middle one of the five, as I mentioned, that you can uh, kind of get a sense of, uh, of the mechanism of, of global warming. And in fact, I boiled it down to a haiku in one of the chapters I wrote recently. You can see it here on the screen. Earth turns sunlight to IR light that's sponged by folks, greenhouse gases glut. So that's about as terse as we can make the mechanism. And again, these relate to some of the science standards that you see at the bottom. And this is the 400 words actually that we used uh, in our first experiment just to give people a text. And uh, you can see at the very bottom, there's sort of a, not quite the very bottom, there's a shorter summary uh, and that's like 35 words. There's a, a longer summary above it. In the five minute video in the ang angle bracket or the square brackets, you can see we throw in some fancy science and that's about as fancy as we get with respect to the science. And there's like a uh, rhetorical question or two down at the bottom. So you kind of get a sense, hopefully if you listen to that, you can answer questions about, you know, uh, that it's the, what, why there's an asymmetry. That is that the molecules don't know up from down. And if you listen to the five minute video or you look what was in that, those uh, uh, square brackets, uh, you'll kind of get a sense that uh, um, why, you know, not all greenhouse gases, not all gases are greenhouse gases. And you can answer some of these questions. I've got to turn the light back on, sorry. <laughs> we've, we've moved into a new building and they've got lights that will go off if you're not moving around enough, so. Um, and I should point out that this actually was narrated by Davi Diggs, uh, the, one of the stars of Hamilton. He won a Tony from them, he's on Blackish. He was in the movie Blind Spotting. So we were lucky to have him for that. And you know, it's not the case that everyone knows that. I didn't know that when I first asked myself what's the exact mechanism of, of how global warming works. And here are some just opinions, like here's a, a grad student on the cusp of getting a PhD in environmental sciences that didn't know it. Here's a colleague that was publishing papers about climate change that didn't know it. There's a geologist I've been working with that doesn't know, didn't know the mechanism. Here's someone who worked at San Diego who was, uh, who was confused about the climate change mechanism and thought ozone was part of that mix. So it turns out that uh, a number of people I asked didn't know it. So we thought, well, why not go to the general public? So we ran a study in, in San Diego where we asked, uh, this was our first study on this topic, 270 people in parks. And it turned out not a single one of these people could explain just that basic mechanism that you could get in the haiku. And they didn't understand uh, the visible to infrared change in terms of the light. Uh, most people were still hung up on uh, ozone depletion. 
We got similar results from high school students like in the 11th grade chemistry class. We just find it odd that journalists and teachers aren't informing more uh, folks about this simple mechanism. And it turns out that, that, uh, uh, that there's a relationship between accepting global warming and understanding this mechanistic knowledge. And we found that not only in the US, but in Germany and a couple different places. And this clearly suggests that there's that this notion that there's no relationship between scientific literacy and accepting global warming, that's just false. Um, and so it wasn't the case that these San Diegans, you know, just denied that global warming is occurring, even though they didn't know the mechanism. There were a bunch of them that strongly agreed that global warming is occurring. Most of them, in fact, almost half of them agree that human activities are a significant cause of it. So we thought, well, why not just tell people what the mechanism is and see if that changes their mind about cl climate change and if they can learn the mechanism. So we ran a study. We have actually have run uh, about seven studies so far. We call them the jam experiments because it's sort of got a jam sandwich uh, uh, kind of analogy. It's answering the question is maybe it's mechanistic ignorance that partly explains US reluctance to accept climate change. And since that's a causal question, it's a great time for an experiment. So the metaphor of this sandwich is that, that there's a pretest and a post-test, each of which is like a, a slice of bread. And in between is the jam, which is a 400 words that explains the mechanism. So this is what the sandwich looks like. So we basically ran this study and we had other fancy conditions like no pretest groups and things like that uh, because we're pretty good scientists. So what were the results? Well, you can kind of see that uh, in the middle column that before the script, description on these three different aspects of climate change understanding, like what happens to the light and the greenhouse gases, the energy dynamics, that mod there was pretty modest understanding, but after the description, it, it doubled or tripled. And we found that, of course, these are uh, quite uh, robust statistically and all. And we think this is important because, again, knowledge correlates with acceptance of global warming. But we we figured we should ask the question: Does this increase in, ex in understanding of global warming also increase people's acceptance of global warming? And sure enough, that happened as well. And in our first two studies, we did at Berkeley and in Brownsville, Texas. Again, we found very robust results there. So you can show that not only learning about global warming is possible, the mechanism, but attitude change is possible too, which clearly disconfirms sort of the stasis theory that people just believe what they want to believe and they're not going to be changed by information. And that's good news because it worked with heliocentrism and that smoke or can smoking cancer link as well. And again, we found these relationships between even willingness to sacrifice about the climate and people's acceptance of global warming and their knowledge of global warming. And this is true even when we look at uh, German data with regard to environmental attitudes and behaviors, there's correlations there. And as a, a few of our studies have shown uh, we, that these are pretty robust uh, sort of temporal sort of uh, changes as well, because even 34 days later in that high school uh, chemistry classroom I mentioned, we still found significant uh, gains in acceptance of global warming. So it seems like it's pretty robust. It seems like the stasis theory is just wrong. And it turns out even the polarization is wrong. That is that we found, as you'll see here, that people are changing even if they're conservative. Now this is uh, from a much larger study. We ran a mega study with 1,100 participants. But you see in the blue, uh, these are the immediate gains. And this is from a nine point scale. But uh, you see they're all positive. And it was regardless of which party people were from. And even nine days later, when we tested them on a delayed post test, you see in the green here, they were still robust and increased in their acceptance of global warming. And the correlations were basically zero. If anything, uh, the, more liberal, the more conservative you are, the more likely you are to increase your acceptance of global warming based upon the information we provide. So I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about how we the statistics with global warming and increasing acceptance about that. So this comes from a line of research called numerically driven inferencing that my group has been working on. Here's an example. We ask people what's been the change in Earth's atmospheric methane concentration since uh, 1750. And uh, you know, if you have someone who thinks maybe that not much is going on in climate change, maybe you think, oh, it's maybe just 5% increase. But if you're listening to the video, you can know that it's much higher. We've almost tripled our concentration of methane just since the dawn of the industrial age. So you might imagine that would change people's thinking. They might be more worried. They might even be willing to pay more taxes in terms of uh, stopping climate change. So what we did is we uh, ran studies where uh, we put in these special statistics. And usually it's very important uh, to ask people what they think first. So in the mechanism studies, we ask them 
what they think the mechanism is before we tell them it. Uh, and we, in this study, we asked them to give us their uh, best estimate for a bunch of statistics relating to climate change, and then we'd give them the, the feedback. And um, because if you don't put your cards on the table, you get what's called hindsight bias, and you figure, oh, I knew it all along, and then there's not as much conceptual change and attitude change about climate change. So this is sort of like a double-decker sandwich where we have both asking people for their estimates, and then we give them the feedback for each of those estimates. And again, these relate to some uh, Earth systems performance expectations in NGSS that you can look at, uh, about four of them there. So it turns out when you give people statistics, uh, they're, they're pretty useful. These are some examples. One of them is used by a number of other people that sort of suggests it's basically unanimous. 98% of climate scientists believe that humans are causing global warming. Uh, this is an interesting one where we asked for every 100 record lows in the United States across the entire nation, how many record highs are, are there? And you can see there are 204, so we're basically having more than double the record highs and record lows, which tells you which way the temperature is going. Uh, these, these are actually old data. It's now to like 380 months in a row. So we've had basically 400 months in a row where each of those months have been higher than the 20th century average. And these are sort of related to some other statistics I made for journalists called the 40 numbers that everyone should know, but most people don't. And we've even tested people from Fukushima, from Japan, and they also underestimate the effects of global warming. So these statistics are pretty salient. And indeed, as you can see here with the green, when we actually give these seven to nine statistics, we find that uh, just giving feedback on their estimates increases people's acceptance of global warming uh, rather markedly. And uh, another way to think about it is it decreases their denial. And again, there's no polarization. Uh, conservatives are incorporating this information and increasing their acceptance of global warming at the same rate that liberals are. And just to give you a sense of it, we're reducing denial by almost 30% here. And this is even nine days later, nine days after they saw the uh, statistics and the feedback on them. So if you wanna break this down for students, you can actually you know, talk a little bit more about each of these statistics. This is one visual representation of uh, the contrast between what was going on in, in terms of uh, 1951, 1980, in terms of normal, cold and hot, and what happened from 2000, 2000, 2005 to 2015, in terms of changing that distribution to much harder days. So um, these are some of those statistics we use. These are seven statistics. I'm just putting them up in case you wanna come back to this later and, and, and have a look at them. And as I mentioned, we also use statistics in the form of graphs in those BEX things. You can sort of ignore this part. It sort of explains why people should change their minds by looking at those uh, temperature graphs like I showed you earlier. And we ran 10 different conditions. We tried different variations of what kind of information we give them, what kind of averaging, how much, and so forth. It really didn't matter. All 10 of them were statistically significant. We were 10 for 10 in showing that you can increase people's acceptance of global warming by just giving this little BEX curriculum that incorporates the the, and, and the contrast between temperature versus the stock market and so forth. And everyone was significant even nine days later. We again, we're getting 25 to 30% denial reduction uh, regarding global warming, even nine days after people got their curriculum. And if you're interested, this sort of shows an extreme view of uh, temperature change where we do 64 year moving averages as opposed to the 16 year span averages that you saw earlier. Uh, and it really, it's very hard again to tell which one is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which one is, is global warming, uh, the temperature change, uh, but the one on the top is actually the temperature change. So uh, it's very useful. Even economists at the uh, uh, Chicago School of Business often can't tell these apart. And again, you can see in green some of the standards that sort of relate to this with respect to the NGSS. So what we did is we took a lot of these um, uh, examples of uh, of uh, ways in which we can increase people's acceptance. And we started putting them in this uh, website, howglobalwarmingworks.org. And hopefully you'll all go and visit that after I'm done. And it's a direct to the public wisdom boost. Uh, it's part of the clean network. So you can check that out. I put the link in here. And often what I do is I give cards where I, on one side we explain the mechanism. So when I give talks, I give out these cards. On the other side, we have the statistics, a little quiz people can take. Uh, and basically, you know, we are explaining the, the, the mechanism in those videos. It avoids the middle folk of uh, instructors who could be better than they are, or journalists. And it turns out even at college, uh, uh, more, than, uh, more than half of the 
people who teach global warming at college don't quite have the exact mechanism down right. You know, they have this sort of bouncing model of how light bounces off the earth, which isn't quite right. We're hoping to make uh, global warming sort of round earth evidence so that everyone can understand it and it's quite, quite salient and easy to understand. Hopefully you'll share our howglobalwarmingworks.org link. Uh, we've it's sort of gone quasi viral, I guess I would say. We've had over 300,000 page views on the site and the videos and from 200 countries to 20,000 towns. And if you actually look at what people have done in the media that, who've written articles that are just about our stuff, just about the website and our experiments, it's well over a million uh, page views. And we're looking at comments and we're analyzing them and incorporating them. We have very few deniers. Uh, occasionally we have some, but mostly it's thanks, this is great. So we've gotten good feedback. Uh, the public comments are a little bit different, partly because they're public and others want to like share doubt more rapidly. Some of them may be bots. Um, if you look at an article by npr.org that was just about us, our stuff, you'll get a sense of that. We've been translating things into their languages, even analyzing uh, comments from Chinese users. Uh, we've included the seven statistics on the site, so you can see that as well as like our videos and texts and different languages. We've added a couple of VEX graphs that you can have a look at as well. This is what the, uh, the main screen looks like, uh, roughly a little change since then, but you kind of get the sense. You can see the videos, they're sort of salient in the center left. And uh, we've got the seven numbers over toward the uh, upper right. And above that, you can look at the Dow Jones and the, and the, uh, uh, and the temperature and uh, contrast. And then there are various languages uh, and translations. So, so, you know, some of the features of our five minute video, just to give you sort of a sense of what's in the full version, is that we crucially ask people to guess first. And that turns out to be important, again, for hindsight bias uh, removal. And uh, we're basically telling people, look, this is secret knowledge that virtually no one knows. Maybe one in 300 Americans might know this. This idea that uh, the, the different light comes in, that we have basically a leaky one-way valve uh, is one way to think about the atmosphere in terms of heat and that humans are causing it. And basically global warming is an extra greenhouse effect on top of the naturally occurring greenhouse effect. Uh, we include a little bit of uh, evidence in there, and we give that two extra sentences of real science that deals with whether or not molecules are asymmetrical or symmetrical, being critical and knowing whether or not they're greenhouse gases. We've uh, tried these videos in Germany with some pretty good accept, uh, accept, uh, success there in terms of increased acceptance. Again, if you share the link, that'd be great. And there's some more connections to the uh, NGSS performance standards. This is what it looks like on the clean network for the How Global Warming Works uh, uh, information. So you can check that out there. I feel like a salesman, wait, well, wait there's more. Uh, how much would you pay for a Mandarin version? So indeed, we've been translating uh, things into different languages. We have three different uh, kinds of videos with full on audio and labels. And we've also been uh, setting up uh, sites in China that uh, are more shareable and such. Uh, we're trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. We're, putting in better translations on top of uh, Google Translate for the closed captioning. These are some of the languages that we're working on. We could use some help with some of these. And our goal really is to get 7 billion visitors. And, uh, and we don't even care that much if they come back as long as they, they leave accepting global warming and are willing to act on it. And our hope is that this will foster international agreements because uh, it's not a, a national problem. You really need international sort of cooperation. So one thing you could do if you want to is that share our videos with your leaders, with their representatives, senators, a president, king, whatnot, uh, because many of them don't know the mechanism either. This is a Mandarin page to give you a little bit of sense of our cross-language sort of efforts. And I'll give you a little bit of sense of one uh, study. I mentioned this before, this is a big sort of mega study where we were trying to get across the idea, uh, kind of understand, you know, uh, how much of a dosage do people need to uh, uh, have their minds change about global warming? And so on the immediate post test, you can kind of get a sense that uh, we get bigger effects the, the more people are engaged. So the longer videos tend to give people more of a boost in terms of their acceptance of global warming, whereas 35 words isn't, isn't that much unless you spend a fair amount of time sort of studying it and really thinking about it and incorporating it. The nine statistics do pretty well and our five minute video does pretty well. And then nine days later, we also check to see how things went. And indeed, when there was a significant effect, uh, we found that it was also significant nine days later and there was no significant drop off. So that was pretty good. Uh, we think it's pretty important actually that people have an immediate post test that you actually ask people what they saw and what 
what they know, because if we, you wait nine days and you don't have that immediate test, and then you just test them nine days later, then they don't remember as much. So we've been doing like real good cognitive science on this, I think. Uh, another thing I can point out that even when we give people information that doesn't include the mechanism, like we just give them the statistics or we just give them a video, a control video basically didn't include any mechanism. Nine days later, they knew more about the mechanism. And we think that's because they Googled the mechanism once we referred to it. So it, we found that there are even learning effects outside of the intended uh, realm of our instruction. Well, the fifth way to increase people's uh, uh, acceptance of global warming that I'll talk about today is by talking about sea level rise. And this is relatively new work. We just sent some of this off to a journal. And uh, particularly, if you talk about real estate losses, it turns out that, um, as you can kind of get a sense in some of this information, uh, Florida in particular has like almost 13% of their housing stop in danger if we get a six foot sea level rise as is uh, uh, predicted by the year 2100. Even California has a bunch, uh, and since that's pretty pricey property, it, it gets on the top five of this list. Not only that, it turns out economically that uh, people who live closer to, to the ocean or in floodplains are spending less on their houses, or the in, increase in, uh, of, uh, in appreciation of those houses is less than people who are living far away. So people are already voting with their wallets, as it were. Even people who might be denying climate change are paying less for houses that are closer to uh, flood risk areas. So this is what we call economic information. This turns out to increase people's acceptance of global warming as well. And it sort of relates to that uh, uh, standard at the bottom about how climate change changes have influenced human activity. Um, also, one of the things that we can do is we can talk about what maps would look like under different scenarios. So this also increases people's acceptance of global warming. We have two scenarios where temperature goes up one degree, and that means seven foot, uh, seven foot rise in sea level uh, the other one is four degrees Celsius, and that's a 29 foot rise. So what would that mean in terms of like Southern Florida? Well, we show people maps and you can see how much is missing even with just a seven foot rise or a one degree Celsius rise for Florida. And even more dramatic is a 29 foot rise uh, with a four degree Celsius rise in temperature. And finally, we show a certain extreme thing. And uh, this is, is somewhat helpful, but not as, maybe as powerful as the others uh, in, in uh, uh, in, at least in isolation, it helps when it's linked with others. But the question we ask is, what if all the Earth's ice melted? And sure enough, uh, all these cities would be gone. Basically, you'd have 214 foot rise of sea level if like even the Himalayas were bare. And this is what the Southeast United States would look like. So you'd actually, if you look at the Mississippi River, it basically just becomes ocean uh, through much of Arkansas and almost toward Tennessee. So you'd have ocean front in Arkansas and it'd all just be the Atlantic, the Gulf would be gone. So um, some people ask me, well, what can I do as, as an individual? And m some students might ask you this. And so one of the things we tell them is, well, you can tell your representatives and senators about your concern about the climate. You can vote for people who will inhibit global warming the fastest. And locally, you can consider maybe one fewer child, one fewer dog or cat, because those take a fair amount of resources. You might eat, uh, change your eating habits, a little less lamb, beef, and non-canned shellfish, shellfish, maybe don't dig up some stuff that doesn't need to be dug up, like extra gold, silver, and diamonds. And according to a couple of researchers, these are some of the things that you can do on the home front to make, uh, make things a little better in terms of the release of greenhouse gases. And so here's a slogan that one might consider, that history won't be kind to you know, diehard or an intentional climate change deniers. Well, I'm already to the conclusions, and it looks like we're pretty close to being on time. Uh, so I'll just buzz through some of this. Uh, most of this you, we've already talked about, so I won't belabor it very much. Uh, and you can scroll back and see some of this. Uh, I'll point out that really one of the most important things is if you can get people to generate an estimate or a prediction or ex try to explain the mechanism before they get the feedback, it's really important uh, that they put their cards on the table because surprise is an important component of this. The more people are surprised about a statistic or the mechanism, the more likely they'll change their mind about climate change. Uh, we've shown that in a number of experiments, even with things relating to abortion and immigration. Uh, so we, we've talked about some of these. On the bottom is the, uh, the coast being swamp that we just talked about with those graphs and so forth. Again, these are connected to uh, NGSS performance standards. Here's some more conclusions, including our Beck story and how stasis is rejected. Um, and some of the other things we're working on is uh, reducing someone's sense of nationalism. I won't belabor that. Uh, we can talk about just how inexpensive it is 
uh, to, uh, to switch over away from fossil fuels. Uh, also, another one we've been trying out is like why you should trust scientists, like I was talking about how if anyone would do it to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, we've talked about, we're working on some other ones I won't get into, because our hope is that we can get all societies, all nations to this tipping point where they start taking global warming even more seriously and as quickly as possible. And there are seven and a half billion people out there. They need help from cognitive scientists like myself and from folks like you. And howglobalwarmingworks.org, we hope is a part of that solution. And so I urge you to go there. And we have in Mandarin and other languages. So I think I'm uh, pretty close to the 45 minutes of talking I was supposed to. So I think I'll, I'll just buzz through this slide just to remind you in, in red, the five different ways I've talked about today in which uh, we increase people's acceptance of global warming. There are the texts that people can read, the videos that people can watch, uh, the statistics about the effects of climate change, the information about the economics of future sea level rise, as well as the graphs uh, regarding uh, the, the maps about Florida and, and Southeast United States, the graphs, the VEX graphs that compare the temperature over time with the stock market over time. And I hope you'll go to How Global Warming Works and check it all out. Uh, but at this point, I should probably just say thanks a bunch. And I think uh, here I'll show the link, uh, the Chinese link if you're interested, and uh, a couple of the, the references. And this is me riding an air wheel. It's a one-way segue that uh, gets me around town. So I'll uh, stop there and we'll see uh, if Ed wants to moderate some questions. Well, thank you very much, Michael. That was fascinating. And I'm very glad that this is gonna be recorded because there was a lot of information that I know I'll be accessing in uh, the weeks to come as, as I start to uh, absorb some of this. Um, we do have a few questions. I want to invite people to go ahead and put questions in the chat box if you have them and I'll uh, share them with Michael and have him respond. There have been a couple so far, some to me individually and some um, to the group. One that was to the group, Michael, had to do with uh, teachers that um, sometimes feel a, a little uneasy teaching about climate change. They're, it's very political. They fear feel for the, their, they fear for their jobs sort of thing, um, or at least um, the community response. Have you done any work in terms of, or seen any work done in terms of helping teachers feel more confident uh, in terms of sharing such uh, information in their classrooms? You know, I haven't done much on that, uh, but I should say that one of the ways I got into this was because I noticed the correspondence between uh, people's denial of uh, evolution and people's denial of global warming. And in fact, our studies indicate that the correlation between that is about 0.5. That is, uh, if someone denies global warming, there's a good chance that they'll deny uh, uh, climate, uh, that they'll deny evolution as well. And I think you have to be very careful and sensitive to folks. I mean, there isn't so much of a religious relationship because there's nothing in the Bible that says, yay, verily, the temperature of the planet shall never, on average, leave 58.5 degrees or something like that. Uh, so I think what you can do is you can focus on the information and the, the topics. And when people give you pushback, you can query them and ask them why they think that it's not occurring. So like I was on an airplane and this fellow thought it was, uh, uh, thought it was volcanoes. And I said, okay, so why in our history is the planet uh, generating more volcanoes? And he said, well, I don't know why. And I said, well, that's curious because you trying to explain something without a mechanism, whereas we have this mechanism, you know, that explains it in terms of uh, greenhouse gases and the asymmetry of light. So why would you accept this one thing that is basically mechanlessness? Uh, and so I think that's one of the ways to try to keep the topic on the, the level of evidence and how different hypotheses can be supported. But I realize that, you know, with parents and everything that a, a teacher will have to tread pretty lightly. And a lot of it will depend on the particular or guys, like what particular district you're in, what sort of resources there are, and the kind of uh, rapport that you have with individual students and also with the parents. I don't know uh, if that helps. <laughs> it does, and, and, and thanks for that. Um, one of the uh, comments that just came into the chat box is from S. Erickson, who speaks to um, that that person does teach uh, about global warming and focuses on presenting data and analyzing it, but also uses Skype a scientist to help, uh, I, I, would, I would assume, um, provide some credibility and opportunity for some direct discourse with scientists in that. Um, one of the, uh, the 
um, uh, questions that came up as well is, and you sort of addressed it is, do any of the climate deniers uh, that you've worked with or interacted with, uh, you mentioned volcanoes, mm -hmm. other mechanistic explanations and data driven explanations that are given by the deniers um, as, as you interact with, with that community? Well, I think that more often than not, they're vacuous when it comes to mechanism. And that's another sort of difference with respect to uh, evolution. There is an alternative purported mechanism, which is creation, right, in uh, evolution. But there isn't something in the Bible that sort of suggests uh, why we would be in a static temperature or, or something like that. But more often than not, I think there's, there's a couple things, especially like uh, that there are natural cycles. And sure, we're getting hotter now, but history has shown that um, we get hotter and then we get cooler. In fact, uh, Donald Trump recently said that, yeah, I understand that it's getting hotter, but it'll get cooler again. Uh, and yet there's no discussion of what that mechanism is by which we get cooler. Uh, scientists actually do know the mechanism by which we've had ice ages and gone out of ice ages with Milankovitch cycles and things like that, right? But we should actually be going into a cooling phase right now. And so the mere fact that we're getting hotter tells you, you know, that something is not quite right. And so what you can do is you can point out how dramatic the increase in temperature has been recently and how we've never seen that historically in terms of like the 800,000 year old ice cores that we're pulling out of Antarctica. The one mechanistic thing that I think that is most tricky is that people will point out that in the past, when we've had warmings on this planet, that the temperature has risen first and then CO2 has followed it. And uh, so they'd say, gee, these scientists don't even know what's going on. They think that we're getting hotter, but they're saying that the temperature, that the CO2 is causing the temperature rise. So, so they have this sort of backward. And so clearly these climate scientists don't know what they're talking about. But in fact, they do know what they're talking about, that we're in an unnatural warming because we've put so much carbon into the air, so many greenhouse gases, that that's now driving the temperature. Because usually because of these very cycles, yeah, it turns out that Earth was warming up because our uh, you know orbit and our, and our axis and things like that are causing it to, and then that causes CO2 to come out of the oceans and methane out of the tundra and so forth. And then you get this positive feedback cycle, but we're driving a positive feedback cycle because we're doing the gases first. So that's the closest thing that I've seen to deniers that have like an element of mechanism that really is, causes people to be puzzled. And if you're not ready to respond to it, then you're a little bit in trouble uh, because of that. Okay, thanks very much for that, Michael. Um, I, there are a couple of uh, pedagogical questions that have um, come up. One is, um, do the materials on um, how global warming works, do, does it include any of the guidance about how to teach from the materials? You had mentioned some things about how important surprise is, getting people to guess first, those sorts of things. Are those kinds of uh, strategies and recommendations provided along with the website materials? Not in the website. Um, you kind of have to go to my writings to see some of that. And part of it is because I wanted a little bit of a firewall between our direct to the public information from how global warming works, where we just provide the basic scientific factual information that we know changes people's minds. But we haven't spent so much time on like how teachers could use it. Uh, but if you look at, uh, at some of the written papers, you'll get much more of a sense. Uh, but honestly, I mean, to, to date, mostly I've been focusing on, um, on uh, just the broad general public, and especially people who can vote. Uh, certainly kids will be uh, voting soon, and hopefully they'll be voting in even higher m numbers than 18-year-olds usually do. Uh, but that's something that we're working on now, and I'm partnering with some other people who are we're trying to do that a little bit more. So the basic information, I think that teachers have to sort of look at and see the, the particular five different ways or whatnot and try to incorporate it into their teaching. But we haven't provided much in the way of, uh, you know, more explicit, like how you'd put this in, in front of 30 kids in a classroom. Okay. Um, one of the other more specific questions uh, that comes to mind is you're, you're using some fairly sophisticated st statistics, uh, graphs, things that um, I don't want to characterize math as being something that repels people, but we all know that there's a certain level of math anxiety out there, uh, if not math phobia. And at the same time, you said something about writing at a fifth grade level uh, so that it was, so that the, the language was understandable. 
is, do you see the people that you work with having issues with um, understanding the, the mathematical representations that you're providing? Well, I think in general, uh, people don't understand graphs as well as they might. So the Beck's graphs are probably uh, something that is a little bit more useful for older students. But some of the statistics really aren't very sophisticated at all. Like one of them was uh, there were 150 glaciers in Glacier National Park in the year 1850. How many are there now? And I think that's something you could easily get across to a uh, fifth grader, right? And they could guess. And you know, if they think that there's no global warming, they'll just say 150. If they think there's just a little bit of global warming, maybe they'll say, oh, 130. But in fact, there are only 25 left. So only one out of six glaciers is now left in Glacier National Park. And so I think what a teacher could do is they could cherry pick among the statistics uh, and the sort of uh, use the ones that are most appropriate for the understanding that their students have, or they could mutate one. So even the ratio of like 204 uh, hot uh, record hot days to 100 record low days, that would probably take a little bit of unpacking for people. And you might use those two distributions. You might say, well, if, if uh, things weren't changing, it would be 100 to 100, right? We'd have just as many record highs as we'd have record lows. So if you have even 101 record highs, that means something's a little out of balance. So I think that uh, many of these things can, uh, are, are pretty approachable. And if not, I'll bet clever teachers can make them even more approachable. Oh, uh, I think there's one more question that we have time for, Michael, and that's um, there's, we often see um, the, the term uh, climate change used these days. I noticed that you're using both global warming and climate change. Um, is there a difference and is the indifference important? Is it something that people should parse out as they're teaching this? Right, that's a great question because for a while I was using them sort of synonymously myself when I was first getting into this. And then I realized that global warming is really just the most basic thing. It's just the phenomenon. That is that the average temperature of the planet is increasing. Now it's not increasing everywhere on the planet every time. Of course, half of the Earth's at night, right? So it'll be cooler there. But if you look at like maybe roughly 58 degrees Fahrenheit is the average of our planet. If we go up to 58.1, on average, that's global warming. Now, climate change is based on the phenomenon of global warming, but that involves the effects of global warming. So it includes like more droughts or, uh, or more uh, dangerous hurricanes or more rain in some places or changing uh, uh, Gulf streams or different animal populations dying or, or, uh, or thriving or plants no longer working or pests changing. So, all those effects of global warming are what we call climate change. So that's why I, I use them both. It's not that there's, you know, some people say, oh, they rebranded it, but really global warming is just the phenomenon of this planet's getting hotter. Climate change is like all the rest that follows from that. Okay, very well stated. Thank you so much. Um, and we're just about right at time. So I want to thank you again, Michael, for uh, such a, a very um, well thought out and, uh, and um, helpful webinar. Um, there's so much here for people to work with. I think it'll be very well used. Appreciate that very much. Um, Thank you. And if you, anyone has questions, you can email me. I'm at ranny at berkeley.edu. So I'm easy to find. I sure appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all, or chat to you all, <laughs> as it may seem. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, and with Please that, make Michael. Make sure that you take the post webinar survey. Yeah, there's a couple of things, Michael. If you could uh, put the slide forward, please. You bet. That was Carla McAuliffe, by the way, folks, um, who's uh, one of the organizers of this series. Uh, the post-webinar survey is there. That you can see the address on the screen. Um, I believe it will also be made available through the uh, through email to those whose email we have. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention is at almost the same address, but. Um, the, the numbers are 212708 at the end. That's where the webinar recording will be posted. So if we can, um, we wanna make sure that people provide input because this is a community series and we wanna make sure that we respond to the interests of the community. Uh, I think that, um, wanna get in, Michael, if you could move forward. 
Sure. I think the slide says 212735. Is that a different one than you intended? Well, 212735 is the, um, that's the survey. That's oh, the post okay. our survey. And then 212708 is where it will be posted. Oh, uh, thank you. Recording. So thanks for clarifying that. That's helpful. <laughs> Again, uh, future events are listed here. And those of you who are local to uh, DC or can get to DC uh, could take part in the gift workshop that is listed there. Um, I encourage you all also to uh, access the Nesta Facebook page, which if you're not already receiving uh, announcements through the Nesta Facebook page, it's, it's a wonderful resource for uh, especially K-12 teachers, but really anyone who's interested in these issues uh, in terms of community announcements and other information. Um, if you did uh, miss an earlier webinar, you can access them uh, at the address that's on the screen as well. And we will um, do our best to get the, uh, at least the chats that were items that were to everyone posted along with the video. And I think that is the last slide. Um, oh, thank, thank you for participating. <laughs> thanks very much for participating, everyone. Here's the contact information for those who um, uh, are the organizers. Please feel free to be in contact with us if you have other webinar ideas or needs. We'd be very happy to address those in future webinars. So again, Michael, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and the, uh, the benefit of the work that you've done for the community. And thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, thanks.